Well, good evening again. It's a, a privilege to speak once again. We are partway through a, a series in Luke uh, where we've been looking at the parables on a, the Sunday evenings. And tonight I would like to deal with uh, Luke chapter 15. Now, we're not just going to deal with one parable or even two, but all three that Alistair has uh, read to us tonight. And I'm hoping in the time that is available that we will get through them. Now, a quick recap of what a parable is. I, I think if we'd been through Sunday school, we might have recited to the kids uh, that a parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. Now, uh, Roy Zuck in his book, Basic Bible Interpretations, he puts it like this. He said that it's a true-to-life story to illustrate or illuminate truth. In other words, a short picture or message that can help us to understand uh, that we can relate to and understand in order to uh, grasp a truth that God intended us to comprehend. Now, I've, I have a, a headed this section on Luke chapter 15, Repentance, Restoration and Rejoicing, which helpfully starts with the letter R, and uh, I'm hoping that's something that you'll be able to remember. Now, the three R's once used to refer to a... Uh, reading, writing, and arithmetic in the 19th and 20th century. That was the kind of curriculum for education. I think as we've got into the 20th century, the three R's might stand for, uh, I guess for us, if somebody was to ask you what the three R's are, then you might say that it's reduce, reuse, or recycle. Either way, uh, the helpful, uh, the helpful uh, letter uh, of R will help us to remember the key point, right? Whether that was the, the agenda for education or the agenda for living sustainably, I'm hoping tonight that these three R's you will be able to take away and it will help you remember the message that is contained within Luke 15, which is a repentance, restoration and rejoicing. It's one of the most important truths and I think uh, it's largely forgotten uh, and ignored probably by the majority today. How good, is it, uh, how good it is then when we come to the word of God that we have the confidence that what is said in scripture is truth. And it is true. And it's as relevant for us today as it was when the Lord spoke it. So the big idea in Luke 15 uh, is this, that it is something or someone that is lost and is found and the celebration and the joy for those involved that comes afterwards. When we talk about uh, the word lost, we're referring to someone or something that is not in its rightful place. It's not with the person to whom it belongs. And therefore, it is of no use to the owner. Right? We know this. If you take a £10 note and you, and you lose it, right? it is of no use to us when we're at the supermarket checkout. Or a train ticket, it, 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 when we lose it, right? it's of no use to us when we go to bo board the train. We should note, however, though, that the, the value, it still has a value, right? So when you, the, the £10 note still has a value. The train ticket still has a value for the proposed journey. As we move on to... This uh, idea of being found, we are thinking of the opposite. We're thinking of something being back in its rightful place, back with its owner, back in service, right? Fulfilling its purpose, reconciled, restored. I'm sure there's many other things that you're thinking as I go through a list like that of what it means to be found. Restoration is a, is, is a, a magnificent concept. We often think about, I and mean, you probably you watch programs of houses and furniture uh, and things that are restored. Maybe in, in a modern, maybe in a modern way, when your phone software has gone a bit skew if or a bit wonky, you might restore it back to its factory settings. So you take it back to where it started from, and it's in a state now that can be uh, of use, and it has a value to the owner. Uh, similarly, it is this is the same with us and God. You see, man was created by God and in his image. And we were created to belong to him and to have a relationship or have a friendship with him. We'll see over the, these three parables what it means to God. And I think if you've kept your Bibles open, you'll see this phrase repeated, for a sinner who repents. When they're found, when they're restored, you know, when they're reconciled, when they are, we use a word that we use in, in a, a Christian context often as a word saved, when they are saved, and we'll see what, this, what the outcome of that is. Now, just to put into a bit of context, right, the teaching ministry of the Lord in, in Luke chapter 14 seems to have attracted the despised tax collectors and sinners. 
people who were out like outwardly sinners. Uh, we see that in, when we get to chapter 19 with Zacchaeus, uh, somebody who was despised and he lived uh, outwardly different from the Jews of that day. Even though Jesus' Jesus's message was clear, right? The way that he taught, the way that he preached, the way that he went out of business, it reproved their sin. Even though, even though that was the case, many of them acknowledged that he was right and they took sides with Christ against themselves. In true repentance, they acknowledge him as their Lord. And we find that whenever, whenever that happens, Jesus is willing and he gravitates towards them and he bestows spiritual help and blessing upon them who act in this way. The difference is the Pharisees and the scribes resented this fact that Jesus fraternized with people who were avowedly sinners and they did not show the, the grace and the uh, humility that they should have shown to these people. And they resented Jesus for doing so. In fact, when they, at the beginning of our passage, uh, Alistair read uh, that they hurled this charge at him, that he came to eat, uh, he received sinners and eats with them. And they meant that as a kind of a, a slight against him, as a bit of a slur, but... In actual fact, this was a, the fulfillment for the very purpose that the Lord Jesus came into the world. We read that elsewhere in scripture, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. You see, God seeks out sinners. We see that in right the way at the beginning of the book of Genesis, when God sought out Adam and Eve in the garden. Right through to the words that we have quoted probably today about the Lord Jesus. In fact, I'm sure that Colin said that this morning. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Whereas the Jews, they kind of operated in a different way. They operated uh, and they worked on their obedience to the law and of personal purity to try and gain favour with God. And they were angry with Jesus uh, and his actions for, uh, for acting in this way. I wonder if you can remember back to the beginning of July. On the 3rd of July, I spoke on the Good Samaritan. The Pharisees had totally forgotten that they were not able to gain favour with God in this way. And so the Lord, the Lord Jesus goes on to then speak these three parables to illustrate the truth of repentance and restoration and rejoicing. The first of these parables is a parable about the lost sheep. It's a clear picture story to the, the men and women in that day that they would easily have related to. Now, I think probably for us in Edinburgh, it's probably somewhat removed, right? For us city dwellers, we don't tend to keep these kind of animals in our flats and our houses. So it's probably maybe slightly removed, but I'm sure that you can get the picture as to what the Lord is speaking about here. This is a picture of these publicans and sinners who had become separated from the flock. The people who that the Pharisees and the scribes despised, they were looked down on and they had become outcasts as it was clear from their lives, right, that they, they lived in a very sinful way. Uh, as the story... A, progresses we read uh, the question about the man to whom the sheep belonged right and it's written as a as a rhetorical question and I think this is I think this is a key thing to note it's written the question is this that as if there was no doubt that the shepherd to whom they or the one whom the sheep was lost there's no doubt that he would go out and he would seek those that the, the lost sheep until he finds it you see this sheep has has been lost in its own foolishness uh, I, don't know, I don't know if you've seen sheep, but quite often if you're driving in the countryside, a sheep will have found a little gap in a fence and in its own wisdom it will have gone through and it gets itself lost. It's lost in its own wisdom and its own recklessness. And Isaiah would read the words, all have sinned and gone astray. We have turned, every one of us, to our own way. But the shepherd knows the value of the sheep, just like, as I mentioned, with the 10 pound note and the rail ticket, the sheep still has a value and the shepherd has a deep care for and an interest in its well-being. And so he sets out to look for the sheep. Now, I've already mentioned this in a Sunday school context. It's quite, it's quite a, for those who have grown up in the Christian circles and gone to Sunday schools, you remember your Sunday school teacher would have really dramatised this type of story. And, you know, maybe we can do that tonight when we think about the shepherd who would have went out to look for the sheep and it would have been a long, hard journey maybe even into the night, uh, across hills, 
and mountains, and uh, depending on how theatrical your Sunday school teacher might have been, you might have mentioned the fact that, you know, it faced the danger of meeting a lion or a bear, which is not outside uh, the imagination of, uh, you know, what we can think about would happen to that sheep. The sheep itself, uh, and I think we can appreciate this, the sheep itself would have been hungry and thirsty, it would have been in distress and in danger. And that is the, the point of a shepherd looking after a flock of sheep. It keeps it safe. It, we often quote Psalm 23, but it keeps it safe, it looks after it, it leads it where it can get food and water. But the sheep, uh, on its own, on its own folly, has gotten itself into this position. Not able in its own strength, nor in its own wisdom, to be able to return itself or make its own way back home. So the shepherd seeks until he finds it. And he lovingly lifts the sheep and he puts it on his shoulders and he carries it home. Now, as we've been through these parables, we have, we have lifted out a, a, some of the, the, the picture language that a, the Lord is trying to present. And in this story, it's a beautiful picture of the Lord Jesus right here. That he would search for lost sinners. And carry them home, right? Not on our own might or our strength or by our own understanding or our wisdom, but by his love and his grace. And upon reaching home, the shepherd calls his friends and his neighbours and he rejoices. Now, this is not some kind of cheap party where we go to forget our worries and our woes, but this is a deep satisfaction that the, the sheep that was lost is now back in its rightful place. It is now restored to the one to whom it belongs. Jesus makes it clear that this speaks of the joy that is found in heaven over one sinner who repents. Actually, uh, Scripture says that there is more joy over one sinner who repents, who realizes that they are wrong and that by repenting agrees with God over their sin and the way that they live and also the way to be right with God. Not by our works or wisdom, but by the, the saving power of the Lord Jesus. The Lord Jesus refers to himself in another place in scripture of the good shepherd. As far as he's concerned, the, the, uh, the, the journey of the shepherd includes his descent into this earth, his public ministry, his rejection, his suffering, his death. And how tr uh, this might be an old one for some people uh, in the audience, I'm sure most of you will know it, but uh, how true is the lines from the hymn, the 90 and 9? We don't sing it anymore, but it says this. But none of the ransomed ever knew how deep were the waters crossed, nor how dark was the night that the Lord passed through ere he found his sheep that was lost. I think the, the lesson is clear. There is joy, and this is, this is one of the key points of Luke 15 that we often gloss over, but there is joy in heaven over one sinner who repents. But there's a small section just at the end of that in verse 7. There is no joy over the 99 sheep or the sinners who are not convicted of their lost condition. That verse doesn't actually mean that there are some people for whom need no repentance. For we understand well in other places that all of us are sinners and that we all must repent in order to be saved. The verse instead describes those, as far as they see themselves, who need no repentance. That kind of leads us on to verse 8, which is the next parable that the Lord speaks about. And it's similar to the first. We find a story that the hearers would have known well. And I've done a little bit of research. I don't think it particularly matters, but this coin would have been belonged to as part of a set. It appears in the Jewish uh, tradition that as part of a kind of engagement uh, arrangement or a, or a wedding necklace, there would have been a, there would have been a, a necklace or a, a, some kind of head, a, a headband that would have had 10 coins in it. And a, the person to whom it belonged loses one. Now, I was, as I was preparing for this, I was remembering a story a, a good number of years ago, probably back in 2005, where my sister, or 2000, yeah, 2005, a, we, had, we were going through my cousin's baptism in East Ayrshire, and she'd taken off a ring she'd popped it in her hat with other bits and pieces and she had moisturised her hands on the journey, as I'm sure some of you guys will know. 
Uh, and then when she'd finished, she'd popped the hat back on and we'd gone into the, 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 the hall in Golston. And only when she was sitting in the, the seat did she realise that she had lost her engagement ring. And I'm sure that you can all just imagine the, the panic and the distress that ensued. Well, it's similarly as part of this story as well. Palestinian houses would have been fairly dark, not like what we have today with electric lights and smooth walls and level floors and all such like. It would have been a completely different uh, house. And the same rhetorical question is asked, who wouldn't do this? If you had lost a coin, who wouldn't do this? And Jesus, in asking that question, Jesus is, is explaining the concern and the care that he has for those who are lost. And therefore, that he would then seek those who were lost. Now, remember, this is in the context of the Pharisees who are looking on angrily. Jesus is explaining these parables to them. So the, the woman lights a lamp and she searches until she finds that lost coin. And we can just imagine her joy, like my sister Gwen, at finding that in the street later. In fact, she actually found it in her hat that was on her head. But uh, she had searched up and down the street and it was only until she took her hat off did she find this engagement ring. Well, similarly for the woman. Verse 8 says that she swept her house and looked diligently. And this kind of gives us an idea as to the value and the worth of the coin. She searches really carefully. And I think that also gives us the idea of just how far she was willing to go and to, to the extent and desire that she wanted to find that coin that was lost. Now, again, like the point in the first parable, she too calls her friends and our neighbours and rejoices when she has found that coin. Now I think kind of in both of these stories and both of these parables, it's easy for us to take them granted because I don't necessarily think that we are that invested. Uh, maybe in the second story for, for the women in here that have lost, or maybe the men that have bought the ring, but uh, certainly if you've lost your engagement ring, you might be a bit more invested. But uh, in terms of the sheep, we might not be invested uh, as much because uh, I don't suppose there's any farmers in here tonight. Uh, but the, the, the people in them days, the Pharisees, the scribe, and all of the people that would have been gathered there uh, listening to the Lord Jesus would have known the impact of these stories quite acutely. As lost, both of these items have no value to the, uh, to the owner, but they're not worthless, as we've mentioned previously. But they're not useful, right? To the owner, there is dead. And Jesus was actually saying that God searches out for sinners who are in this condition. No wonder that the, the Pharisees and the scribes are offended by this, right? There's no place in their legalistic theology for this kind, for a God like this. And as I mentioned, as we opened up, you know, God, God searches for uh, sinners. We see that right, right the way from the beginning of our Bibles in Genesis chapter three for Adam and Eve, when they had sinned and they had hidden themselves from God, God comes out and searches for them. And in spite of their supposed knowledge of scriptures, the scribes and the Pharisees forgot that God actually is like a father who pities his wayward children. Now, there are a few joys that match, those, uh, that match the joy of finding the lost and bring them to the Savior. A quote from uh, John Wesley says this, that the church has nothing to do uh, but to see souls saved, and therefore we should spend and be spent in this work. Now, that brings me on to the biggest section in Luke chapter 15 verses, 20, verses 11 to 32 where Jesus really elaborates on the message that he is communicating about the need for repentance and the need for restoration and the joy and the rejoicing that this brings to those involved. I think quite often when we look at these uh, parables we quite often focus on the repentance part. We may focus a little bit on the restoration but I really think that quite often we miss the fact that there is real deep satisfaction and joy over one sinner who repents. Now, I'm sure, in fact, Alison already mentioned this, but I'm sure if you've, if you've been around in Christian circles, right, you might have heard the, this parable being referred to as the parable of the lost son or the parable of the lost of the two sons. Uh, but I think it could also be called the parable of the, great, the loving father, right? I think it emphasizes, as you look at it again, I think it emphasizes the graciousness of the father more than it does the sinfulness of the son. But unlike the shepherd and the woman, eh, the father in this parable does not go out and seek the son, but it is instead the memory 
of the Father's goodness that brought the Son to repentance and forgiveness. Romans chapter 2 verse 4 says this, Or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead us to repentance? So let's have a look at some of the details within this part of the chapter. From the, from the start, we see that the son did not understand the father. He didn't want to work for the father. He didn't want to live by his rules. And he didn't want to, I don't think this is, a, I don't think this is pushing it too far from the context of his murins, but I don't think he actually wanted the father to be alive. That's why he goes on then and asks for all, of, to ask for the portion of goods that would be have come to him in the event of his father's death. I think as sinners, we have all been in this situation at some point, that we have not wanted to live in that environment. When when the son comes and asks for the portion of goods, I think again from a little bit of research uh, that this could have been... uh, this could have been allowed in kind of Jewish law, whether it was common or not, it was certainly allowed. I don't know at what point in a father's life that he would have accepted it, but certainly this, might have, this would have happened before. So I don't think this is too unusual. Now, in Jewish law, which is probably not similar today, but the elder son would have received a bigger portion, maybe even double a portion to the son or other sons uh, that his father would have given his estate to. The father divides the estate and gives to the son as we read, both sons actually, as we read in verse 12. And then as you come down, if you've still got your Bibles open into verse 31, you'll see that the father reminds him of this when he says, all of this that I have belongs to that elder son. But we'll leave him there for the time being. And I just want to focus on the younger son just now. See, the younger son imagined that this would allow him to go and enjoy and live uh, as he wanted by his own rules uh, and you know, enjoy the freedom and all that that this would bring. He kind of shunned his father and it shows that his, his heart was far away from him. He rejected the safety uh, and the joy that that provided. The son had the choice. Once he had received the, the, the portion of the goods that were going to befall him, he had a, a, a choice to make. But as he's considering this, and I guess through the story you can see this, that the, the perspective, uh, the, the son's perspective of the father was skewed. And this is why he acts in this way. He doesn't understand his father. He wanted to live separated from him. Now, I think we need to probably understand some of the kind of cultural uh, differences of that day. Uh, and I think when we start to look at a bigger picture in scripture, you see this, that uh, they would have lived much more in familial settings. So they would have lived in you know, large family circles. And we only read about two sons here, but they would have lived in large family circles. Uh, you know, servants and, and workers would have been part of that domestic situation. I think in this day and age, we're probably removed somewhat from that kind of familial setting. Uh, you know, we live in relative affluence. We've got you know, social safety and, and, and welfare. And, you know, if you look at even in Edinburgh, there's many homes that are just occupied by single people. So we're a little bit removed. But what we're not removed from is, the, is children who do not want to live under the, the guidance of their parents, nor are we removed from uh, people who want to live recklessly. The son goes off and he lives as, as he wants. The word prodigal means exactly that. It means wasteful, you know, one who spends money wastefully who lives reckless, recklessly extravagant. And, you know, similar today, right? We see people living in that same way who just want to live with kind of reckless abandon. We, I smiled as I, as I was putting this together with this quote that probably many of us have used, right? YOLO, right? I mean, just, you just, you live as you want. You live as you please. You only live once. So, you know, let's, let's go and do it. Well, the younger son, he ends up in a situation that this extravagant living exhausts the the resources that he has. And in addition to this, there's a depression that comes over the land and the fun and the friends and all that he enjoyed comes to an end and evaporates, right? Times are tight and he finds himself forced to do for a stranger what he wouldn't do for his father. And that is to go to work, to live and to work in that uh, way. 
I think this is I think this scene in the parable is the Lord's way of emphasizing what sin really does in the lives of those who reject the Father's will. Sin promises freedom, but it brings slavery. It promises success, but it brings failure. It promises happiness, but it brings misery. It promises life, but we read that the wages of sin is death. And for most of us that know a who have repeated that many times, we know that that is that word for separation. When God is left out of our lives, enjoyment becomes enslavement. And we become slaves to this world and the master and its masters instead of the one who created us. The man finds himself in a pigsty feeding pigs. And the Bible, and Alice has read this, but the Bible reminds us that he would have filled his belly with what he was feeding to uh, the pigs. It tells us that the money that he was receiving for this job that he was doing wasn't even enough to buy him food and he is he's just brought low and in in his misery his mind is taken back to his father's home and as he thinks about home and about his father he sees his father in a new light he sees his father as the father always was and continues to be and we'll see that as we move on no longer just the guidance, right? We, you, you can appreciate this. Not just the guidance and the rules that are part and parcel of living at home, but also the peace and the joy and the stability that that affords. And the better conditions that he, as he's sitting there in the field feeding the pigs, he, it comes to mind that even the, even, his, even the servants that work for his dad have enough to eat and to live comfortably. They make enough money for them to buy food but as he's sitting there he doesn't just pity himself feel sad and then go on his way regardless as many of us do when we are in a kind of situation like that and I think this is I think this is where it gets to the kind of absolute thrust of the message that Jesus is teaching he wanted them to understand what it is to be truly repentant in this parable about the son who sees his father in a new light, it's in the right light, with clarity of mind, and he agrees with himself in that when he was sitting there, considering his father's home and all that, was, all that he could enjoy in his father's home, he saw his father in, this, in, this, in the right light. So it wasn't, it wasn't that his father had changed, but just in his mind he sees his father in the right light. And he acknowledges and agrees within himself that the father's way was best. The son is repentant. And what do I mean by that? Well, it means that he changes his mind about his father. And not only does he change his mind, but he goes on to show that in his response. A complete change, right? Had he just stopped here, he would only have, he would only have experienced regret and remorse. But true repentance, true repentance involves not just the will, uh, not, but it involves the will as well as just the mind and the emotions. The son resolves, and I think this is part of it, right? the son resolves, and he says this, he says, I will arise, and I will go, and I will say. And this is what our response needs to be. Verse 18, he says this, I will arise, and I will go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. See, the young man, he just can't remain, he cannot remain this is what he's saying to himself. I can't remain here as I am in this condition. He recognizes that he has wronged his father and he has failed to live up to the standards of a son and he is truly sorry. He changes his, he changes his mind not only about himself and about his situation, but he admits that he's a sinner. When he goes back, he says, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. Uh, in that, and I, I never finished the rest of the verse, but in that, he recognizes, and I think this is key for us, he recognizes that his father was a generous man and that service at home is, is far better than freedom in the far country. You see, for us, I think it's God's goodness, not just man's badness, that leads us to repentance. You know, if the young man had only thought about himself, about his hunger, about his loneliness, about his homesickness, he would have despaired. There's no hope in that situation. But his painful circumstances helps him see his father in, in a new way. And this, this is what brought about him hope. If the father was good, so good to servants, 
then maybe he would be willing to forgive a son. And this, it, this is the part of the story that, that brings joy to your heart. As the man, as the young man approaches home, his father sees him in the, dif- in the distance. And I got a text this morning just to remind me that the father runs and greets him and kisses him and brings him home and he asks for the best to be done for his son. We see that the son doesn't even get to finish his confession, his confession and yet the father is ready to act and receive him with joy. In fact, it's this, in the same text, a good friend that texted me this morning just to encourage me, he had, he had quoted a, a, a line that my grandfather used and uh, I'm sure there's a few lines that will come out, but one of the lines that my grandfather used, he said this, he said, he kissed him when he still had the smell of pigs upon him. Now, you know, when we think about us, God receives us as repentant sinners, not as polished Pharisees, but as repentant sinners in the condition that we repent to God in. Now, the son did not deserve this, given the way that he had spurned his father. He disrespected him, he disappeared from him, from him, and yet we see the goodness and the kindness in the fact that the father still loved the wayward son. And he too, like the first two in the, in the first two parables, he too is filled with joy and he invites his family and his friends to rejoice and to celebrate with him. For he says this, for my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Now, the Pharisees listening to this, and I asked you earlier on just to park the older brother, but the Pharisees that were listening to this are shown as the older brother. They claim to have served God uh, all this time, but in reality, their hearts are far from the father. Note, you'll see that in the verse there, that the older son actually wants the same as the younger son. As he asks, he says, you never give me a fatted calf so I could go off and enjoy it with my friends and not with his father. And that is why Jesus' parable is fully understood when we see that each one of us are in this parable somewhere. Now, for the majority of us, it would have been in this prodigal son. But there might be some of us who are, who are sitting here like a Pharisee, just not considering the fact that there are people Jesus came to seek and to save that were lost. The Pharisees were annoyed at the fact that the Lord Jesus was eating, that was receiving sinners and eating with them. And that that is the extent that the Lord Jesus tells these three parables. And there might be some of us that sometimes act in this way, that we are just a little bit annoyed that there are people who live an outwardly sinful life and yet God is willing, as as the loving father in this story, to receive them when they are truly repentant. But we can see ourselves... All of us in this room today can see ourselves in this parable. None of us have been living as we should, and that is why the Bible says and reminds us that we've all sinned and we've fallen short of the standard that God expects. We've already quoted Isaiah, that that all we like sheep have gone astray. And we read elsewhere in Scripture that there's a way that seems right to man, but the end thereof is destruction. So what does that mean for us today then? How do, we, how do we take this passage and how are to, we to apply it? Do these three R's that I've mentioned resonate with us? The Bible tells us that God is the same yesterday and today and forever. And so we come to learn that these principles are indeed relevant for us. You see, as sinners, we must repent if we are to be accepted by God. We must accept that like sheep, we have disobeyed God and we have, we, have, we have become lost in the folly of our own wisdom. Like the coin, we are unable to find ourselves. And, you know, the far country exists in our hearts, right? For we are in our natural state, we are far from God. Colossians 1, 21 says this, And you, who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds. Repentance is about changing our mind and seeing that the way that we live is an affront to our maker. It's accepting that by that God's design and desire for our lives is the only way that we should have been living. But the point, one of the points in this, the three R's, restor, uh, repentance, restoration. But, the, but there is a, a piece in here that reminds us that we can be restored. We can be brought back into relationship with God through the death and the resurrection of of his son, the Lord Jesus. 
He said, I am the way that this can happen. He said, I am the life. He came to give, uh, he came to give us life. John 10, 10 reminds us, I am come that they might have life and they might have it abundantly. Just following on for that verse that I quoted in Colossians 1 and 20. 1 and 22, it says this, but now he has reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present us holy and blameless and above reproach before him. Like the clothes that the father presented to the son to demonstrate that he was his son, as restored people, we are clothed in Jesus' righteousness as we stand before God. And our father sees us as righteous as his son, Jesus. And that brings us on to this, the last R, which is rejoicing. You see, joy is deep satisfaction and delight, both for the seeking saviour and for the saved individual. And this is what brings joy, and this is what brings joy to the waiting father. If you're repentant and have been restored, reconciled to God, then this parable tells us that the joy that fills heaven and should fill our hearts. The Christian life, as we probably all know uh, from what we think about uh, on our prayer newsletters from Brunsfield, the Christian life can be tough. But as a true believer, we experience that deep joy when we are right with God. So as I finish, I want to encourage us not to forget about these three R's. Repentance, restoration, and rejoicing. And if you've not found that deep peace and joy that is afforded by the Lord Jesus, then I just ask that you consider this message. That there is joy over one sinner who repents. And the Father is waiting to forgive those who come to him. Now, before I hand over to Alistair, I just want to pray for us. And I just want us to consider these three R's as we uh, think about what's been said tonight. Our Heavenly Father, we come before you. We thank you that in your word, uh, we find stories like this. Simple stories that we can understand and that we can remember and that we can just see the truth that, that you have for us. Our Father, we thank you that this reminds us that you are a loving Father and that you have our interests at heart. And our Father, even before the dawn of time, you had salvation's plan and that you were willing to send your Son to come and to seek and to save that which was lost. Our Father, we thank you for our salvation, for those who have come to uh, put their trust and faith in the Lord Jesus. Our Father, we thank you that you are uh, willing to accept and forgive us. Our Father, we just ask that as we have thought about this, that we might just consider our lives. And our Father, that all of us might just be repentant in how we live that displeases you and how that we are often far from you. And our Father, we just ask that as we consider this tonight, that your word would speak to us, uh, that, that might just ring in our hearts and our minds and our Father we just pray that as we uh, just consider this message tonight that you indeed will be glorified in sinners that seek you and that are saved and so our Father we just commit this time to you we give you thanks for it and we do so in the name of our Lord Jesus. Amen.